welcome everyone. It's so awesome to see everyone dialing in from literally all over the world. It's a bit overwhelming to be honest. <laughs> um, not, so not only are we here to talk about the upcoming 2022 Commute Women's Rallies um, that Lael's going to talk you through in just a moment, but also to address anyone who's ever had doubts about entering an event or just signing up for an event like this. We've got a really, really exciting panel of experts, both Wendy, who's been doing some fantastic research and has an ongoing project looking into specifically this issue, mm. and also Caitlin, who's a coach who's going to have some really hands-on um, exercises for us and will hopefully go away with some really useful tools um, which we can use in situations like these. We're going to be really strict on timings, like we said, and we're going to we're going to save most of the Q and A for the end. Um, but yeah, as Gabby said, drop them down in the box below. And it's really important to highlight that we're going to do another panel uh, or webinar just like this, addressing the more practical elements. So like what you need to take, what kind of bike you'll need, how you deal with like personal hygiene on the road and things like that. Um, so if you've got any really specific questions about those, then that might be another webinar for you um, a bit closer to the events. Now, before we go any further, we'd really like to clarify a couple of questions that we've had in the lead up to this webinar. While the concept of the commute rallies was first imagined with women in mind, we'd really like to make it an inclusive event. So if you identify as female, non-binary or trans, we'd really, really love to have you involved. We also acknowledge that as a panel, we're not perhaps the most diverse in several ways. And I think we've got really overexcited about the subject matter and in the process overlooked the need for diversity on this speakers panel. We are reviewing this planning process with the aim of being much more mindful of this in future and the diversity of future events. And this is very much a work in progress and we're really, really open to your suggestions and feedback on this. So we'd really appreciate that if you have any. So without further ado, let's introduce our panel. Lael, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, I'm Lael Wilcox. I'm an ultra endurance bike packer from Alaska. And I found so much joy in going out on my own adventures, racing, riding alone, riding with others, that this is something I really want to share. Um, a huge motivation for me was, you know, my personal experience, I show up at these events and I'm the only woman. Uh, and that's not a terrible thing, but I thought, what if there were more of us there? Or what if we created specific events or opportunities for women to be out there and feel like this is something they could do? So that's my motivation. And I'm so thrilled to be hosting two of these events this year and getting more women on bikes. Right, thank you. Over to you, Wendy. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Wendy Ellis. I'm based in France, uh, very close to Germany and Switzerland. It's a beautiful part of the world. If anybody's ever here on a bike, I'm happy to take you out and show you around. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the stuff that um, I uncovered last year. Diversity and inclusion is a big passion project for me. I also work in women in tech, trying to get more diversity into the tech area, especially within health. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to talk through some of this with you um, and see how it resonates and how you guys can help us move this forward as well. Awesome, thank you. And Caitlin. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Cockerton. I am a certified life and leadership coach, um, particularly passionate about getting people moving in the wilderness as a key facilitator for personal growth. My company is called Great Heights Pathways, and you can find out more about me there. Interesting fact for me on this panel, I don't own a gravel bike or a mountain bike, I have a road bike, but I'm a relative beginner um, in this space. So pretty outdoorsy, excited, kind of in this uh, mode that some of you guys might be in, which is considering, is this right for me? Could I possibly do this? Um, yeah. Fantastic. And Gabby, just for those who miss you at the very start, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Gabby Thompson and I'm the Global Community Manager at Kamut. Um, outside of work, I'm a big fan of any kind of adventures. Um, and I'm also, I really love to make the most of the different seasons. So I'm based out here in the French Alps. Um, at the moment, you'll probably find me mostly out of my skis or snowboarding, but in the summer, I'll be on some kind of bike. So whether that's road, gravel, 
or scaring myself on my mountain bike, um, I'll be doing one of those. Um, I've also got two young children, a little girl who's four and a little boy who's two. Um, so I spend a lot of time exploring the outdoors with them. Fantastic, thank you. So that's our panel. And now we're going to head over to Lael. Um, if you'd like to describe for us exactly what is the Commute Women's Rally? Yeah, so our first Women's Commute Rally uh, last year was on the Torino Nice Rally route. Um, the idea is it's an open invite for women to meet together, uh, have dinner, and then start the next morning, uh, but it's not a race. So the idea is to take on this challenge, ride the route, uh, and try to make it to the finishers party about a week later uh, to celebrate just the adventure of it. So everyone's expected to be self-supported, uh, but there aren't really any rules. You know, along the way, you camp with different people, you visit different towns, you ride with different groups. And I found that this is such a great way to uh, get people to kind of share ideas, uh, take on adventure and have a community. Uh, so this next year, we'll have two challenges. The first is on the Montañas Vaxius route. Uh, which is in Spain, uh, fairly close to Valencia, and that's a 680 kilometer route. Uh, this year, the event will be April 28th to May 7th. Um, so that gives you eight days uh, to take on the route. Breaking that down, that's you have to ride about 85 kilometers a day. Uh, it's mostly dirt roads, so gravel bike or mountain bike would work. Uh, and then beyond that, it's kind of your own adventure. Uh, but the special thing about this route is the route builder Ernesto is a local to the area and he's kind of taken it through places that are really special to him. It's a very low population and super, super beautiful. Perhaps if you're just talking about Ernesto there, could you tell us a little bit more about the work that he's doing using this bikepacking route that's pretty unique to the region? Right, so uh, this is kind of uh, like a, a region where pop they're losing population over time. So there are these beautiful old towns that are historical, but uh, really only the older generation lives there at this point. They don't really have any business. They don't really have any economy. So bringing bikepackers through uh, kind of breathes some life into the region. That's really cool. It is known as the, uh, the desert of the Spanish Lapland after all, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so how would you describe having had this rally last year where we're all, um, road from Turin in Italy to Nice in France. How would you describe the Women's Rally community? Oh, it's, it was amazing. We really only launched the event about a month before we actually went and did it. And we just had such a great response from women just trying to get it together just to make it. Uh, and it was so welcoming. Everybody showed up and they're just kind of sharing the passion for it, sharing information, uh, making new friends and, and trying to help each other kind of get through it. Because the thing is, it's hard. Even if it's not competitive and it's not a race, it's, you know, you're facing mountain passes. You're figuring out where to sleep, where to get food. But these are all uh, kind of part of what makes it fun, too, is that, you know, it's fairly simple day to day. You're just kind of living on the bike, but uh, you do have to cover your basic needs. So it was cool to do that with a group. And do you have any like real lasting memories, things that you know that you're going to remember for decades to come from that trip? Like what really is highlighted in your mind? I mean, I think really the best of it was kind of the beauty of the route and then how we ended up over time all kind of coming together to camp for the final three nights and how that was special and how we could have finished it faster, but we didn't want to. We're like, let's take the full time to spend time with one another to really get to know this group of people because a lot of the people I had never met before um, and that made it really, really special uh, just to really kind of savor that time and, and um, enjoy it. And I really have to say that it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever ridden. Yeah, it is stunning. And as somebody that joined that trip um, on my own, I knew a few people that were gonna be there, but essentially traveling for the first time on my own or without my boyfriend for quite a long time, um, I didn't know what to expect. And if people were actually gonna just all go and do their own thing or be much, I expect everyone to be much, much, much faster which they were, it just meant that I got up earlier and <laughs> got a head start. <laughs> um, but actually that like community element and having a WhatsApp group where we could all chat and say, hey, we found this really great camp spot if you're coming by, or there's this chalet with a couple of extra beds, you should come along. Like that was really, yeah, one of the standout things for me. 
Yeah, and I mean, the thing to remember too is that these routes are public and free and available all the time, but to ride them with a group makes it special. To show up and, and be part of this community is, is what really makes these events special and it's, it's free. You know, you just get to be there and, and kind of see how it all goes. So that was really, really cool. Amazing. So we'll come back in our next webinar to talk about the more practical side of how we're going to prepare for Montana's Vacias. Mylen will, will uh, tell me if I've said that right or not. <laughs> um, but is there any particular aspect of this trip that you're really looking forward to? I'm so excited for this because I've never ridden it. I've never ridden in Spain at all, and I've wanted to for years. And actually, I you know, after the Trino Nice rally, I thought next year, let's do one in Spain with absolutely no idea how that was going to go. And then within that week, uh, two route builders that are really um, respect recommended this route specifically. And it's really well documented. And Ernesto's put so much passion into making this really amazing and special that uh, it was like kind of a no brainer. And he's super supportive of us hosting an event and, and getting more people out there. Um, so I think it'll be a really amazing mix. There are refuges along the way, places to kind of sleep in old shelters and these small towns. And I think culturally, it'll be really fantastic. Yeah, for anyone who hasn't had a chance to check out the commute collection already, um, there's the route in there, along with a link to Ernesto's collection, which has heaps of detail and gorgeous photos and if you can look at that and not get mega inspired to ride there, then I don't know what will inspire you. <laughs> so yeah, I totally recommend that. Thank you so much, Leo. Um, we're now going to hand over to Wendy and we'll come back to you for the Q&A at the end. Great, okay, thank you. So um, last year, 2021, I had a, a, some extra time on my hands because all my races that I signed up for got uh, postponed due to COVID, some of them even twice. So be careful if I'm signed up for a race you're in, there's no guarantee it's gonna happen this year. Hopefully they will though. Um, anyway, so it was good. It gave me a lot of time to do some work on .cc, cover some races, which was a ton of fun. And it allowed me to get a little peek behind the scenes in the uh, events to get a better understanding to the diversity inclusion, which has been in great discussion in the community and it's wonderful to see. Um, as I started to poke around to try and understand a little bit more, there was four topics that were kind of like the bulk of the conversation that was happening. Um, and they're what I call hard barriers. These are the kind of things that if you've got just one of these in front of you, it's game over. You're going no further at that point. Um, the most uh, easy one to notice is financial. Unfortunately, some people in the world um, just don't have the means to have access to a bike um, and to the race. And it's just, there's, that's the, the unfortunate reality of it. And without that, you're not gonna be at the start line. Um, politically, some people are unfortunately born into countries that just don't have the possibility to visit others. And so getting a visa to come and race in the US or in Europe is not a given. Um, and so they're not gonna be there either. Um, physical ability. If, for example, you're differently abled and you use a recumbent style bicycle, a lot of the races don't allow this. So you're already out of the, the game for that one as well. Or if maybe potentially you're a partially sighted rider and you generally ride on a tandem with someone, that as well might not be permitted in the race due to the rules. Um, and the last big one that was really being talked about was uh, Cultural exclusion. Um, certain races and populations have actively been excluded from places of recreation um, and even evicted from their own lands historically. Um, and where we're at today is that what we're living in is really the, the great white outdoors. So these are four kind of real sort of real hard barriers, as they say. The good news being, there's a little animation if Gabby can press, <laughs> the good news being is that the community is so behind this and there's great initiatives that are addressing these. We've got, uh, for example, Lost Dot has the Mike, uh, Mike Hall bursary for people from a lower socio socioeconomic background so that they can be part of it. Nelson Trees, he always has some spaces available in his place in his races for locals. So they get a chance to showcase their talent. And we're seeing more and more races pop up into other parts of the world, which is fantastic. So that more local talent can show their, their talent. Um, physical ability, uh, Virangi uh, last year put on an incredible downhill race, which was uh, built around supporting differently able uh, people. 
And I believe she even took on British cycling organization to get this done. So she is a force to be reckoned with and it's great to see what she's doing in the community. And then last of all, the ultra distance scholarship, Taylor and the Stair Cycles uh, team have been working hard for a couple of years to make sure different communities know about this and that they're part of the, the start line that we're gonna see. So uh, <laughs> this year, three fearless rookies are gonna be at the start of GB Duro and uh, can look forward to a week full of um, rain and mud, no doubt, but I'm sure they'll be happy while they're there. So it's good, good news. We've got great signals, uh, these hard barriers, the stuff going on. And in theory, it's simple. We just need to make sure more people know about this and make sure that scholarships are embedded, uh, support getting more differently abled, uh, prioritize races out there. And then if anyone wants to pick up the small problem of geopolitical rights of access, then we get job done. We can all go home, <laughs> no problem. But so I was, I was quite happy when I saw this and I was super excited by the motivation. But what stuck out to me was then when I go on my Instagram and I'm scrolling through my feed, there you all are. You are all these people that are out there, you're enjoying your life on two wheels, like everything from the nice Sunday ride right through to maybe even doing the festive 500 in one go so there's the real wide spectrum of you guys yet your names weren't on the start list that i was looking at for dot watching and so i was kind of really curious at this point if while we're working so hard on these these hard barriers making great progress what is it that we're not seeing that's stopping you guys getting to the start line because this is obviously a different different conversation you all have at least one bike. Some of us probably guiltily maybe have more than one in the garage. Uh, so finance was not the hard barrier. Yes, it may be a friction point. Yes, you may have to compromise at some point, but it wasn't the hard barrier. You had access to a bike. Most part, a lot of you live and were born in Europe and North America. So you're in proximity to a lot of the races that happen and uh, you don't have the political hurdles and things to jump through. And uh, let's face it, if you're thinking about doing the festive 500 in one go, you are no stranger to type two fun. <laughs> you understand what type two fun is. So, um, so if you're out there, you're doing this, you're, you're willing to do something a little bit hard and you've got access, what's the problem? Where, where's, what's, what's going wrong? What's stopping you from getting to the start line? Um, and so that's why I started to dig a bit deeper. And I decided to start focusing on gender inequality for two reasons. One, there were three uh, organizers that did it really, really well in 2021 and they got gender parity. And also because of the other work I do. And I wanted to see if there's some parallels. So Gabby, if you jump to the next slide, the three organizers that I'm aware of that got gender parity were Rafa for Panarin Rally, Dominique at the Dead Ends and Cake, and then the Racing Collective for GB Duro. As I spoke to them, I wanted to try and find what's the magic? What are they doing that's making this work? Um, with Rafa, they went on a hunch that if they called it a rally, not a race, dropped everything about competition, performance, pointy end of the race, what, you know, all that kind of stuff. If that was all gone, and they talked a lot more about personal uh, challenge and achieving a personal goal that you had to be, their hunch was that that's what it would that's that would bring in more people and it worked because they managed i can't remember what the exact percentage was but a, a large number of them were first timers to a multi-day uh, endurance race and a lot of them came from the audax world so they made that jump which is fantastic um dead ends and cake they sold out their places within five minutes of the registration being open for their first year um, which is incredible. And within those five minutes, it was the 50% of the female allocation Dominic had set aside was complete. He had a waiting list. Incredible. Um, when I spoke to him, he felt that there were two things that really kind of made it attractive to more people. One was it was more accessible in distance and time. It's one of the shorter races out there. So a long weekend, you can do it. <clears throat> he also had a great barbecue on the last night, which apparently went on until four in the morning. <laughs> Um, and he as well put emphasis on personal challenge, but also encouraged people to really push themselves because he did want to demonstrate what people are uh, capable of. And um, I think also the novel concept, the fact that you get a piece of cake once you've reached the end of the dead end, I'm pretty sure that was a motivator for some people as well. 
Um, GB Duro, uh, they were unique not only in getting parity at sign up, but they had parity at the finish line as well. So of the few people that actually made it to the end, 50% were female. You've probably seen there's been a ton of press about this recently. Um, what's really telling about uh, GB Duro and everything that the Racing Collective do, they put community at the center of what they do. Yeah. GB Duro is described as a scrappy rolling picnic, and it tells you a lot about the tone of the event itself. A picnic is when people come together to enjoy something, <laughs> which not normally words that you would associate with an ultra endurance race. But they do a lot around that to bring that community aspect in. Something that's unique to their event is the mass start at each stage. So as the, the event goes on, everybody starts again at the next stage, which means all the riders come together. So if you're at the pointy end, you're the middle or the back of the pack with the Lantern Rouge, you've got an opportunity to all meet each other and talk about that shared experience and realize that whether you're Mark Beaumont at the front and you're doing really well, or you're right at the end trolling through all the mud, you're experiencing exactly the same thing. Um, they also have a bigger mission. And I have a theory. Um, the Racing Collective really are about uh, trying to stop the climate crisis that we're living in at the moment, and they're using cycling as the mechanism. And I have a theory that any event that puts social, economic, environmental, positive impact as an addition to what they're doing will appeal to some groups greater than event that is much more based around the route itself and as a race, um, just because it's got that added dimension to it. So it's interesting about uh, selecting Ernesto's route and what he's doing for this one. So three great, <laughs> three great things, three great organizers. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> when you then start to look around the gender parity, it drops off pretty quickly. More kind of like sort of like the drop off of the trail after a washout on the Silk Road mountain race. This is, it's pretty fatal what happens, unfortunately. Um, and so there I started to talk to a few of the riders to figure out, well, why not these races? What's going on? And friction points started to pop up in the discussions. And the thing with friction points is that they're not immediately visible. Hard barriers are visible. We can all see them pretty quickly. Friction points are a bit more shady and um, they never come alone to the party either. It's not just one of these that is gonna stop you. So I'm gonna to talk to you not all of the themes that came through, but I just wanna give you a few of the anecdotes in the interest of time, just to get, uh, share with some of the stuff that, that came through. Uh, one of the biggest ones is time commitment. Uh, so a lot of these races, uh, seven days minimum, you're looking at a minimum six month commitment prior to this to train with a good amount of hours each week. That's not negligible for a lot of people, you know, it's uh, finding that time is, uh, is important. And uh, taking time away from family is uh, something uh, as a woman, when you do that to pursue a personal passion, it's not always actively supported, unfortunately. Um, it's really nice to hear the story of the person that managed to do it last year and her family supported her. But uh, last year when I did the route to net zero for, with uh, the racing collective, um, I crossed paths with one, another female rider on the route and it was her birthday that day, which is fantastic. Um, she told me a story though, that really stuck with me. Um, when this, this, this cyclist, she's uh, big in the cycling world, it's a big part of her life. When she said she was going to do this, and it happens to be over her birthday, some of the questions she got were along the lines of, are you really going to be away on your birthday? And that surprised me. It surprised me that people that love us still question our desire to follow our passion, not maliciously, not with no intention, they probably don't mean to do it in a bad way, but it still happens. And it asks the question, you know, do all groups in society get that kind of critique? Um, and what does that impact have? Um, next up is representation. <laughs> you can't see it, you can't be it. We all know this, we've got to have great representation. We're getting better as it in the sport generally, although we can do better because there is more to the sport than the pointy end. Um, what where we stumble a little bit with rep representation is that sometimes it's used as a panacea for everything and this is complex and representation alone does not fix this 
Role models are excellent at inspiring people and telling them that they do belong. And it's important that we keep showing representation and that will help the most motivated people to get there. But it doesn't always reduce um, all the other friction points, no matter how inspired a rider might be. So it's important we keep it, but we have to realize its limitations as well. Um, women's health. Uh, there's more and more discussions around menstrual cycle, but it's, it's, it's huge. It's important. It has an impact on your training, has an impact on your nutrition, uh, even just how you deal with it as you go through, um, go through a ride etc um, so it's really important that the discussion continues on that there's better data that's understood jenny tuff uh, even talks about how during her first the first edition of the atlas mountain race uh, she was a bit surprised when uh, amp flow came to town uh, unplanned and uh, and she had to find a way to deal with it in the outback in Morocco, um, which for, for her, that meant that's a level of resourcefulness that she had to pull on that not everybody in the race needed to. So slightly disadvantaged from that. Um, resources are growing, as I was saying. Uh, Marianne spoke recently about the impact on her, um, uh, on her body post Badlands. She was really open about what, um, what went through that, which was really nice to see. Elle's done a great post about personal hygiene, everything you need to know to make sure everything's going okay and keep the bacteria in check. Um, and there's more and more information out there about uh, perimenopause, menopause, post-pregnancy return, etc. It's out there if you know where to find it, but it's not easy and you're probably going to have to wade through a whole bunch of carbon seat post reviews before you get anywhere close to getting it. So it's there, but we can probably make it a bit more visible. Um, Kit, I think a uh, big discussion recently about can we get some bibs that let you go pee easy? That would be super nice. Um, bike packing bags that work for small frames and have enough space for hydration. How about a heart rate monitor that actually goes with your sports bra and isn't a pain? Um, bike fitters who understand how different bodies work and what soft tissue really means and, and how you deal with it. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there that um, there are solutions. It means everybody has to find a little bit of extra effort to make it work. There is usually some kind of compromise on performance. But I think the thing that really kind of resonates around it is that it sends a signal that being female is less than, which is it, it, that ultimately will kind of knock you down a little bit. Um, the next one is a biggie. It's safety. Uh, road riding is dangerous and unfortunately it kills and it doesn't discriminate in who it it impacts. Um, thankfully, there's more and more off-road routes coming, as is this ride. Um, but still, riding alone at night is not for everyone. Some people don't have experience doing it. Um, never mind bivying alone in a country where you're tired and you're hungry. And uh, probably most of your rational thought processes you left on the kilometers behind you on the trail is you just want to get to a point that you want to sleep. Um, it's it, these are all new and they're, they're strange experiences and it's confidence that you have to grow. Some countries, uh, the culture may mean being female is a different dress code, so you have to take that into account. And then there's even some countries where it's just illegal to be gay with a death penalty potentially hanging over your head. These are all very real and it means that the experience for different groups is vastly different uh, because of the impact that this has. Now, not to be all Debbie Downer, safety can be risk managed. There's tons of stories of people out there enjoying a wonderfully peaceful night ride. Uh, you can travel in different countries without repercussions of, of who you love having any ne negative impact on you. And it is possible to get a good night's sleep in a bush. I, I assure you, I've done it many times. <laughs> but we all share this fear for a reason. It's, it's real. Um, and so it does take a different level of courage to engage in that. Um, very quickly, tokenized. Um, this relates a little bit back to the representation one. Um, last year, in an, in, in coming from a good place in an effort to demonstrate inclusion, there was a bit of a wave of over-representation and coverage of certain groups within the sport. Um, and unfortunately, it misses the mark a little bit. So what we have to remember is that it's not important about it is important about who turns up but it's even more important about how they're respected and that they're respected for what they bring to the sport not just for being there 
Lastly, which is the big topic for today, is our own thoughts. Imposter syndrome still living with you guys too and avoiding those eviction notices. <laughs> but it, it, mine's fully moved in. I, I don't think the toothbrush is there and it's not going away at all. Um, but in, when I was discussing this with a whole bunch of people, I heard many people say, I can't do that. I don't deserve to be there. That's not somewhere I should be. Um, even athletes last year on the uh, on the rate on the rally said these are very experienced athletes said yeah I was kind of nervous wasn't sure I was supposed to be there I was really intimidated by everybody um, as unfortunately it's something that we all have um, doesn't stop there either we um, we have a lot of negative self talk about body image uh, what that we don't look like what a cyclist should look like um, we're worried about that we're worried about the judgment that goes with do we have the fanciest kit? Are my socks, are they meant to be inside or outside of my tights, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and everything, all the discussions that go along with it. But the judgment or the potential judgment that goes with that, it can weigh heavy. Um, the, the final thing that all of this leads up to is that surprisingly, it takes a woman longer to apply for an event to register their interest for an event than it does for a man. Now, there could be the reason is that you have more responsibilities, so you need to speak to more people before you make that decision. You can't just see the trailer and then log on at the 2 p.m. And, and apply. You might need to go and speak to your boss, your husband, your wife, your, your, your grandparents, whoever it happens to be, to make that decision together. But what a lot of it is, is that we underestimate our own capabilities and it takes us longer to build up the courage. It's exactly the same as the job application process, which you've probably all heard. We need to make sure that we have all, all 10 points checked before we'll even consider applying for the job. Whereas a man's quite happy with six out of 10 and he thinks he can nail it. So he just uh, puts his uh, resume in and it's no problem. Well, it's the same thing here. It takes us so long to build up the courage to do it and defeat our inner demons. By the time we get to it, registration is full because the men have all jumped in there and just taken a place. And then it's a, it's, it's a case that there's just no spaces left. So all of this, this is just a, it's a very light kind of touch of what a lot of things came in. You see, there's also issues around knowledge. Uh, there's a, a lot of other stuff that came through in the discussion as well. And it all sort of, it percolated new questions in my mind about what about if the scouting team for a route was more diverse, then they would be able to come back with information, not just about how technically challenging the route is, but how will it be experienced by everybody and what do we need to take into account? Um, what about if volunteers were more diverse? So you knew that when you got to a checkpoint, you had a safe space. There's somebody that would understand anything if you needed to share it. Uh, media teams, what about if we got more diversity with media teams? So we're getting a real beautiful spectrum of how this experience is, is done and documented and it'll inspire and reach a whole different group of people and on and on and on. Um, but ultimately what came through was that the breadth of the anecdotes and the number of them it showed me that there's no one problem. It's a nuanced, networked, web, complex, complicated issues, and it's incredibly individual. Everybody experiences it differently in a different uh, formation of these things. And as cyclists, we know that friction stops momentum. And as friction builds, it reaches a point uh, that the effort to keep moving forward towards that start line of an event eventually becomes more than the potential reward of actually getting there. And that's what keeps me up at night. The fact that there's hard barriers or accumulated friction that means groups of people are just giving up before they even start is really, really sad. So I'm super, super passionate to figure out how do we get all of you guys to that star line, because once you're there, I know you're gonna to go totally, totally enjoy it and have so much fun. So, um, why is it important to me? Rallies, uh, races, these experiences, I believe they remind us of the immensity of our own possibility. And when they're done really, really well, it gives us the opportunity to leave a little bit of ourselves 
on that really tough coal that you've just climbed and you get to see an even more deeper beauty in yourself. And that's a possibility that we all have. And I'd love to see more kinds of people having that experience. So my hope is that at some point while I've been speaking, you said when you heard one of those anecdotes, uh-huh, that's me. I totally do that or I totally understand that. And that you feel seen because that's a big part of what this is. However, the adage as it goes is that the plural of anecdotes is not data. And we need your help. Uh, I'm super, super lucky. I'm gonna be working with uh, Hetty Key. We're working on a project called Turning the Cogs. You might know Hetty, she's the wonderful woman, one of behind uh, Pete Gravel Gang, Trad Climbing Festival, Women in Adventure, and she's not only an amazing and experienced uh, researcher, she's also just a massive change maker in this industry. So we're launching a research project to get that data from you. We need your experiences and ideas to be able to build this so that we can bring about evidence-based change because understanding the problem is half of the solution. So we'll share a link and a whole that bunch of stuff afterwards and we can talk about it any other time, um, but we want your help to help shape the research and then be involved as of March. So I will hand off now. Self-limiting beliefs, uh, they often have roots in systemic and societal pressures. And uh, the, if there's one thing we know to be true, uh, unfortunately tomorrow when we wake up, they're not gonna be gone. They're still gonna be there. So what we can do is we can arm ourselves and each other with the tools and resourcing to lessen the impact of those. And I'm super excited now because I get to let Caitlin take the lead and she's gonna do something a little bit different and a really nice experience that I hope is gonna help reduce the friction points around those negative thoughts and the, the things that we tell ourselves that we can't and that it will help all of you get to the start line. Thank you so much, Wendy, um, for speaking truth to the complex issues um, and handing off so nicely. You can hear my toddler screaming in the background. Um, I'm so sorry, everyone. I hope she's gonna settle down soon. Um, anyhow, what I wanna talk to you about is what you can start with, which is your own mindset. Um, I also wanna kind of make some declarations uh, that these organizers that I've been so lucky to, to speak with over the last couple of weeks are really trying to think about. So we can start with ourselves, we can start with us as event organizers. And I'm gonna start by taking you through a short visualization. Um, we've heard Lael's stories from last year. Some of you have seen awesome stuff on Instagram. But right now what I wanna do is actually kind of transport us all into the future. Um, I wanna play a little future video in, in everybody's mind. So I can't see you, but I really encourage you to do this because there's really good research and evidence that tells us what we can imagine, what we can think, what we can feel, we actually can make real. Um, so please give this a go. Um, my lovely panelists are gonna be with me every step of the way, doing all of the visualizations and the funny things I'm gonna ask them to do. Um, and I'd like you to start by taking a couple big deep breaths finding a comfortable seat and position where you feel your bottom on the chair, your back up against the wall, whatever. And with each breath, just let your exhale be a little bit longer than your inhale. Try to pay attention to letting your energy settle a little bit. Taking a few more big deep breaths and letting your eyes close if you feel comfortable to do so. So in your mind's eye, I'd like you to fast forward the clocks to April 28th. You're in Terrell, Spain. You're in a little village square gathering for dinner with about 50 women who are about to take a similar path to you, traversing stunning and remote landscapes carrying everything that you need strapped to your bike. You've got an incredible adventure and no matter what happens, this experience is gonna change you in some important way. As you gather among these women, the sense of excited anticipation is palpable. There's a lot of bravery here. 
probably some anxiety too. It's a new experience for many, take them out of their comfort zone. Many first times solo cycling or sleeping outdoors. But these women are open and they're warm and they're introducing themselves to one another. They're sharing root ideas and alternatives. They're making plans to cook together, to camp together. And they're actively designing this rally to work for themselves and each other. So for some, their motivation to be here was to test their physical limits. For others, it's about taking time for themselves and indulging their passions. For others, it's an adventure with friends. But as you look around the table and you take part in the conversations and you feel yourself coming into the fold of this group, you realize that this is a chance to be part of a pretty badass community of women bikers who are there to create new rules for the sport. These women see a week like this as an opportunity to step into the best versions of themselves. So this isn't a race, it's a rally. Everyone here knows that although they might be solo for parts of this journey, they're not alone. Now take a moment just to allow a few more pictures of that whole week to form in your mind. I want you to imagine maybe a whole bunch of women setting off together, a small group sitting around a campfire, five women whooping and cheering at the top of a crazy call that you've just climbed. Or maybe it's a quiet moment and you're just saying, I am doing this and I am amazing. You know, that kind of solo moment. Now, take a couple more breaths and just acknowledge that even by being here, by simply imagining yourself at the start line, you belong to this community. You are part of an exciting, welcoming change in women's adventure sports. Now, please gently open your eyes and share with us in the chat just one word or a short phrase that represents what you've visualized in seeing yourself part of this race at the start line through it. And I apologize if you imagine lots of toddlers <laughs> along the way or barking dogs, but I, I'm going to guess that you guys have gotten warmth, laughter, awesomeness, passion conversation excitement beautiful thank you so much for staying with me everyone um next slide gabby um it's awesome to have a vision right we need goals we need to imagine ourselves you know meeting those goals and exceeding them and being our best selves but i'm not gonna lie we also need other forms of support to keep us going when we feel stuck. We're all gonna have doubts, we're all gonna encounter obstacles and battle with that internal voice, that demon that Wendy talks about that sometimes says, you can't do this. Um, and at times like this, it's really important to use tools to take that next step. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. <coughs> next slide, please, Gabby. <coughs> Number one tool, a resource state. So this tool starts with you and it's about bringing a past resourceful state into the present moment to remind you of your capabilities, your awesomeness, right? I want you to recall a time when you did something that scared you, but it made you feel fully alive, fully present and appreciative of the amazing things that you can do. Take a moment to think about that. It might be an incredible accomplishment on your bike. Equally, it could be doing brilliantly at work or giving birth to a crazy child or um, <laughs> you know, feeling the fear and doing it anyway, in any form. Take a moment again, if you're willing to close your eyes and just conjure that memory up in your mind's eye and allow the accompanying sensations to like fill up your body. So remember where you were in that moment of strength and awesomeness, what it felt like, maybe 
sensations in your tummy, your heart, in your throat. Maybe you can feel like strong back, strong open shoulders, like heart open, heart full. And I'd like you to find an expression of this strength state in your body. Just give it a name and panelists, show us your expression. What is your expression of your strength, your resourceful state? Are you hands on hips? Are you like V? Yeah, Wendy, she's like on the call with a V. Um, <laughs> and now give it a name. I don't know what the name is, but you do. Summit pose, superhero. And what I want you to know is that these body states that we can actually return to in our moments of doubt, they are super vital kind of mind body connection tool that we can that we can bring about because effectively our body is saying hang on a sec i am awesome like i can reroute the emotions the the kind of intellectual sort of mind chatter that might be going on and i can remind myself of this strong and resourceful state it's a really helpful tool to return to when you go i can't do this and you need that little nudge to take one more step I think we've got some pretty awesome ones in the chat there as well. I saw a couple. <coughs> Next slide, please, Gabby. So a safe sharing space. This is a tool that is down to all of us. Um, that's something that we are doing in the race organizing committee, in this panel and so on. But it's also down to everyone who participates and feels like they're a part of this community, which will be beyond the participation list, right? And this is about holding a supportive space that welcomes us all, that welcomes us um, for who we really are, for what we're really feeling, for expressing what we feel moved to express. Um, and that's a really contrary kind of sentiment to what we might feel in a competition space, right? A competition space is often about fitting in or trying to appear, you know, according to the expectation. In a safe sharing space, it's like, no, bring your full self, show up with your truth, with your messiness, with all of the kind of emotions that might be rolling. And we will, we will embrace that. We will hold it. Um, and that's really important because the reality is that in signing up to a big adventure like this, most, if not all of us, are going to experience some pretty scary emotions. We're going to experience anxiety, comparison, expectations, insecurity, maybe guilt, maybe shame, all that stuff around. I'm not, if I'm doing this for myself, what else am I sort of letting go of? Who am I letting down? These are normal but challenging emotions, especially when you're on your own with them. So when you have comparison, anxiety, expectation, guilt, shame, and you're holding it all within your two ears, it just gets louder. The volume gets louder and brighter, and <laughs> it's pretty dark, right? It can be really hard. Um, but the interesting thing is that when you share them and you share them with people who can stay present to that and, and listen to what's really going on, um, immediately those emotions, those feelings kind of turn their volume down. And that's really important. I think. When I was talking to Gabby initially in this whole panel, we heard like last year, people started sharing their fears organically throughout the rally. Um, and it started to build a sense of connection and community and people felt safe and people felt welcome. See the plus side of sharing all of the, the challenges that we might be going through and creating this safe space is that we get to experience beautiful positive emotions in that space too. We get to experience compassion, empathy, joy, happiness, relief, gratitude, love, belonging, right? All of these things that we want more of in our life. Now, I'd love it if you popped an emoji, a hands up or whatever, like I'm on board. This kind of safe sharing space is something important to us. Just let me know you're alive, you're awake, you're with us. Um, 
And then the third tool I want to share with you is shifting perspectives. So Gabby, if you switch over one more slide. This is kind of building on what, I, what I've talked about with the other two tools, but it's really important you stop yourself when you're in a negative kind of internal mind chatter spiral, right? Um, we have a million ways to talk ourselves out of things and to take what scares us and make it really, really big and to take our yearnings and make them really, really small. Um, we wanna help you do the opposite. We wanna blow up the things that you're yearning, that you're hungry for. And we wanna say, hang on, those fears, actually we can just switch them. Um, we can choose a different perspective. So we've been saying it throughout this panel, this isn't a race, it's a rally. So in race mindset, you might be worrying about where you are in the pack, about being too slow, about disappointing yourself or others. But when you get to shift that to this is a rally, it's about people coming together with a shared cause, a shared vision. Rallies are about uniting people around a change, right? That's what this is. It's like a community that actively wants to write new rules for women's long distance cycling and adventuring. Another shift we want you to take is from performance to participation. So where performance might focus on the end result and we might obsess about where we are in relation to our hopes or our expectations, you shift that to participation and it's all about being present and being there for the whole journey, right? What matters is taking part, creating something together, being inclusive of difference. And finally, we've got from elites to enthusiasts. So we probably have an image in our mind about what an elite cyclist is. Um, and we have all sorts of ways of saying, I'm not that. Um, but an enthusiast is somebody who is simply a lover of this sport and who believes in the experiences that are possible when we lean, lean into it. So finally, I wanna leave you with this sentiment, this kind of idea around minutes versus moments. If you go to the next slide, Gabs. So minutes are spent brushing our teeth, driving to work, training on a spinning bike, putting your children to bed sometimes, especially when they're not doing so great. Humdrum, everyday stuff. Um, but moments, moments are the memories that give our lives shape and meaning. Moments are the things that deliver us into joy and truth and epiphany and surprise and achievement, elation, all those beautiful, beautiful feelings that you guys know. These kind of meaningful moments happen serendipitously and by design. And when we look back on our lives, it's moments that matter. <clears throat> They're the memories that shape who we are and what we've done in the world, right? So we have a feeling that among beautiful moments, um, whatever they may be for you, you know, the births, the weddings, the amazing adventures, the friends, we actually really have a strong hunch that this kind of commute women's rally and the spirit that we're trying to build around it is gonna be full of meaningful moments. We really hope you'll join us and that you're feeling inspired already and connected and ready to say yes to the adventure of a lifetime. Thank you very much, guys. Wow, Ooh. thank you, Caitlin. That was amazing. I'm slightly tearful here. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> that was incredible, thank you. Really, really interesting exercises as well. Um, if you haven't already popped your questions um, for the panel into the Q&A, then make sure you do it now. Um, if not, we will, yeah, everyone's saying that was amazing. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, then we will crack on with the Q&A. Cool, thank you. So we've got a couple of questions in the box already, but as Catherine said, um, if there's anything that you've been thinking about during the session, please feel free to um, type your questions now and we've got a bit of time set aside to talk through them. Um, the first question we have is for Lael. Um, Anna's asking, I feel like women are not taken as seriously as men when it comes to cycling races or long distance events. Do you have the same feeling and what can we do to change that perception? 
Yeah, you know, when I started racing, people would ask me what I was doing there, uh, if I was going to make it through the first day. And I mean, you know, these things got me really fired up and I'm like, I'm going to beat you. But, you know, it's like that stuff, that doubt can creep in. And I guess what you have to do is, is maybe like Caitlin said, resource on previous experiences where you did something hard and you're like, I can do this. All I have to do is manage myself and get through the days. And no matter what people say to me, uh, I believe that. So over time, I, I felt more and more confidence and, and just kept showing up and doing my best. But, you know, ultimately, it's like it, it also doesn't have to be serious. I mean, this can be a lot of fun. You have to have a mindset that, yes, we need to make good decisions along the way, but there can be so much fun and joy involved in, um, you know, just, just getting out there and making it your own. Cool, thank you. Um, and another one which is open to anyone who's had this experience. Um, what's the one thing that stopped you from getting to a start line? I don't know if anyone's ever wanted to sign up for anything and not quite made it. I certainly spent about two weeks last year, bearing in mind I got a, a tip off from Gabby about the <laughs> about the TNR um, before it went out to the general public, but it did take me a couple of weeks to sign up, even though I'm a very much an enthusiast and an experienced bike packer, I'd say I was super anxious about whether I'd be able to keep up, whether I'd be able to do the calls. And especially because the amount that I've ridden over the last couple of years has really dropped due to COVID and just lack of motivation, I guess. But um, even with a month to train and like once I said, yes, I'm going to do it, I was really, really determined. Um, I know that Steyr were holding an event in London. So I was like, I'm going to ride to London. <laughs> and you just sort of like, if you're determined and you do some of that mental work to say, yes, I can do this, I'm going to make it happen, um, then you can. But even for people who you might think, and I'm saying, I'm not saying it's me, but there are a lot of people over, out there who you'll think, oh, yeah, of course, they wouldn't have any limiting self-beliefs or anything like that. I think it's something that more people than you would imagine would share. Cool. Um, I've got another one. I think well, this might be um, something you could talk about um, from Mary Beth. Um, she's currently working as an au pair for a 10 year old girl in Spain um, who currently lives with her dad. And she's asking if you have any experience of getting younger girls involved in cycling, um, inspiring them as a female role model to believe they can do amazing things, especially in the cycling world. Um, she wants to make the most of her time um, as an au pair with this girl and make a positive impact um, and potentially bring her to the start or finish of one of the rallies. And I know you've done like loads of work with like girls at school and helping inspire them to get on their bikes. Oh, we can't hear you, Lail. Hey, is this is this for me? <laughs> Yeah. Yep, it's for you. Uh, yes, I, I am actually, I've hosted three seasons in Alaska and I'm starting one in Tucson, Arizona for 12 to 13 year old girls. Uh, so fairly close to 10. I mean, the, the amazing thing is, uh, and I've seen this with Gabby's kids too, is that kids are capable of so much. They've just never done it. I mean, so we ride together for six weeks to build up to a hundred kilometer adventure ride at the end. And at the start, most of them have never ridden five kilometers, but really if you're just consistent and you ride, you know, we ride three times a week and you take breaks and you make it fun, uh, they can really do a lot. You know, they build a lot of stamina. I think it's, it's so much about learning to take on challenges um, and then having experience and gaining confidence. And this doesn't, this doesn't only apply to us as adults, it's for kids too. And it's, um, it's amazing to see. So and it'd be incredible if you brought her to the start or the finish or along the way a bit. And I mean, that's also something that I'd love to address is that there can be kind of a hybrid version of these rides too. We're not, you know, it's not about you have to ride every kilometer and ride every mountain pass. It's ride what you want to. It should be 
um, you should be able to make it your own and just get out there. And if you can come for the event, great. But if you can't, uh, you could design something similar. You could take a different route, make a start date, invite friends and get something else going. You know, there's the thing about this is that it's there are a world of possibilities. Yeah, I think that's really important point just to highlight what you said there, Lail, about um, especially with these routes with Montana Svahia. So I know that there's loads of different shortcut routes. So you can choose to do as much or as little as you like. There's like a 200K option or the full six, 700K. Um, so if you're worried that you perhaps won't like have been off more than you can chew, then you can always choose to divert. Or even last year on the TNR, we had some people who <laughs> had a, a plane to catch to go home after like four days and they were like pinning it ahead. And it was great because we had this WhatsApp group and we could keep track of where they are. We were like, how did you get there <laughs> in one day? That's mad. Um, and similarly, we had some people where it was their first tour and it was awesome and we could keep track of where they were and then they got a train so they could meet us at the finish and we could all enjoy the sort of like finishers party together. Um, so I don't, even though it's, amazing that the vast majority of us on the last rally stuck together as pretty much one group for most nights camping like it really is come and make of it what you want um and you shouldn't you don't need to feel the pressure to be at the same pace as anybody else or follow the same route um i've got another question um that i think you might be able to talk about caitlin um, how do you find a balance between inspiring and challenging yourself to do difficult things without pushing yourself to bite off more than you can realistically chew with what you have right now? Yeah, it's a great question. <clears throat> I think there's there are some helpful tools um, that you can you can work towards. You can, for example, you could actually divide your life into a kind of pie and think about um, the things that you are already committed to and a portion of time and how to sort of reappropriate that for a slightly better balance towards your passions and what are some of the things that you're going to need to give up in order to do that. It's really important that you don't just add on things um, and realize that actually we we have a certain number of hours, we have a certain amount of bandwidth, we have a certain amount of energy that we can feed ourselves and, and that we can expend, right? So when you're doing that recalibration to welcome something new into your life, it probably means saying no to something. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the hard reality, but having a look at the different dimensions of your life and thinking, you know what, this year, if I'm going to prioritize adventure and that's like top of my list or I'm going to prioritize connection and community because I'm so bloody desperate for it um it means that maybe it's not the same year that you're going to get a promotion or maybe it's not the same year that you know you're going to lean into something else really really hard um that would be my my high level answer to that there's lots of different directions you could go but I'll leave it for now cool thank you um, Wendy, um, I've got a question here from Kaylee. Um, I'm a relatively new cyclist who just got my first gravel build. I feel comfortable with rides around my region, but then the thought of flying off my bike is terrifying. Are there resources for learning how to do international bike packing and what to pack? Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, it, it terrifies me as well. <laughs> I've had I've had my bikes bruised and damaged um, through international travel. Um, so the first thing I'll say is, um, do you have to fly? Maybe, I don't know where you are in the world, but maybe there's an option to get there not flying. If you're thinking about signing up for this, you can maybe find some of the other people that are coming. Maybe one person's driving with a van and you can already get to know some of the people on the way here. Um, that's that's always a great option and that's my little like pro climate um, <laughs> side of things as well um, but yeah there's uh, there are some resources we can I can probably find uh, some stuff and put it in maybe in the follow-up uh, that comes through but there's a lot of great stuff out there that shows you how to pack your bike correctly so that it doesn't get brutalized by the the people when things happen and um, what kind of stuff uh, what kind of bags to use the best ones for it and I think what we can probably figure out with this as well I'm speaking out loud here so Gabby just tell me if I'm saying something wrong but 
because this is a loop and we're starting and finishing the same place, we can probably organize for like bike boxes to be left and things as well so that you don't need to worry about bringing something that's disposable. So if you do have a hard one. Um, and they're expensive, they're not cheap to buy boxes, but a lot of people have one. And so you might be able to just borrow one. Um, I'm sure that you, there's probably someone around you that has one lying around. Um, and if not, most bike shops, they have a ton of them, which they're quite happy to get rid of, um, the, the cardboard ones. So we can put in like some videos for how to pack it uh, properly, but I think we can maybe do a whole bunch of stuff to make sure that it's easy to transport if you do have to fly or transport your bike by whatever means. Yeah, and it's, um, oh, sorry, I was just going to oh. say, and um, someone also just mentioned in the chat that also you can often find um, places to rent bike boxes. And um, I think it's becoming more and more available that you could actually even potentially rent bike packing gear um, and things like that. I was just saying that I was looking the other day and getting a bit overexcited that um, you can actually get the ferry from Plymouth, which is all right if you're based down in the southwest like me. Um, Plymouth to Santander, it's a 24-hour ferry. And then it was like plotting an extra little route to go down. I was like, oh, <laughs> maybe it's, this is more than I can chew. But again, trying to avoid flying if possible. <laughs> well, um, Caitlin, I think this is another one for you um, from Claire. I struggle with getting excited about an opportunity and knowing I can push myself to do it. Then I get eroded by something someone says or something I see and let an application deadline go by, um, even though physically my ability hasn't changed. How do you maintain conviction and self-belief? Another simple question. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna answer that one with a classic carrot and stick. Um, <laughs> double, double whammy carrot and stick. I feel like you, you know, one, one thing that you can do is make the vision as clear and robust and real as possible. Um, you can do that through visualizations. You can do that by something creative. You can draw yourself. You can put that up, you know, in your office, in your kitchen, like make a declaration, make it real about what you're working towards. And you can do that in lots of different ways. Um, and this works for some people, not not everyone. Um, having having a kind of commitment partner um, can also be a helpful kind of stick. That's like, if I don't do this, then uh, I will owe this person X amount of money, or I will, you know, you can kind of create a little bind on yourself, um, which which can be light and fun and and silly, or it can be more severe, but. I would say the most important piece is to make that vision as real and as strong and as big and as present in your life as possible. So how do you keep looking at that vision every single day, multiple times a day, knowing that that's the commitment you're working towards? And also it's kind of systems and structures on top of that, like vision plus the things that are gonna be there to support it. So what's, what are you gonna do every single day getting out of bed first thing it's like my commitment to get on my bike or my commitment to drink this or move my body in a particular way you know what are the systems and structures that will support you moving towards that goal um and we've got a couple of questions here actually along the same lines to do with um how to train for something like this um we've got a question asking if 12 weeks is long enough for someone um, to get ready for a rally and another question asking um, how do you find um, how do you have access to things like training plans or training supports if you don't necessarily come from a racing background um, I'm going to open this up to anyone yeah, who has some advice I'll dive in for that a bit um, I think you know if a great way to kind of train is to commute. So even just doing your errands, trying to get to work, trying to do the things that you can by bike, then it fits a bit more into your schedule. And then you also don't have to focus so much on, um, on it being like an extra addition to your day. It, it already seem, seamlessly gets through. If you have time for that, that's a, that's a great start. That's how I got into cycling in the first place. 
And it's amazing how challenging that can be, but also how invigorating it is to, to try to make it. Um, so that's a start. Can I add to that? I think in terms of these like long distance events, there's two types of training. There's training your legs and your anaerobic fitness and all the sciencey stuff if you want to go down that route, essentially your fitness. There's also training your ass and like your body <laughs> to being in the saddle. It's just pure saddle time, right? Because if you're not, if your body's not used to being in the saddle for like five, six, seven hours every day, day after day, then you might have a few niggles. So it doesn't have to be like the most structured thing, but I'd really recommend gradually building up how much time you spend in the saddle over a series of rides. Don't go like straight out from like a 10 miler to 100 or 150, but just getting the saddle time in um, so that when it comes to it, you're gonna be as comfortable and happy and you understand what sort of things you like eating over a whole day, as well as um, just being fit and ready. That's another yeah. great one is just to uh, do an overnight, definitely. Get out, ride from home, camp out somewhere, ride back. You figure out where all the stuff needs to go, what you like to eat, what you need to sleep, and then also what you don't need because you do want to pack quite as light as you possibly can because it makes the riding so much more fun. On that, I actually have a really terrible confession. <laughs> it's not terrible at all, really. Uh, I signed up for this coming on my own, but I've never actually camped out on my own before. So I was really relieved <laughs> when we ended up camping in groups every time last year. And um, one of the other women, I'm sure she won't mind being named, Diana, um, who turned out, yeah, we were basically inseparable through the rally, uh, got on really well. And she, but she'd brought stuff for staying in hotels or hostels or refuges and stuff. And she was like, oh, darn it. Like, she didn't realize that everybody else would be actually camping. And so I'm hoping that she's going to come back next time uh, with some bivy kit and, um, and we'll take that on. But it was, yeah, it was awesome. Two other women on the event. Uh, Tamara had never used a bivy before. So Nick was teaching her how to use a bivy <laughs> in this like amazing olive grove, sort of terraced olive grove on the side of a mountain where incredibly Nick's AirPod got stolen. Is that what they call them? AirPod? Yeah. AirPod got stolen by a mouse and we found it in the middle of, uh, in the morning, sorry, in the middle of a stone wall. <laughs> sorry, this is a <laughs> bit of a tangent because apparently you can do this thing on your phone where you're trying to find the AirPods going beep, beep, beep. So you can track them and it had taken it out of her in the middle of the night, put it in the wall. It was incredible. But yeah, even if you haven't done these sorts of things before, like overnighters or like me, you're too much of a wuss to go and do it on your own. Um, I don't think you should let that put you off. Um, I've got a really interesting question here, and I think it's um, something that a lot of people here may have experienced. Um, do you have any tips for how to keep the joy after going on a big adventure or an event without instantly booking on to the next thing? Um, we obviously don't all have enough annual leave to do that. Um, but find the combination of tiredness and unpacking return to life can sometimes like get you down. Um, and I've heard a lot of people speak about that and I've experienced myself. You imagine how you're going to feel at the end and actually sometimes you can actually feel yeah it can be a bit of a downer or like those the holiday blues after something really big that you've achieved can actually be quite difficult to work through um I don't know if anyone's got any like experience or like tools we could use here I would come also like to know. <laughs> everyone know about <laughs> yeah, I don't know about like experience of this or or tool specific to biking, but I think <clears throat> you're absolutely not alone. Like it's well documented that for athletes who win a gold medal, which is like the the kind of highest point in their achievement, the lowest point is almost right after. Um, so you you walk away from the podium, and then and then what? Um, I find that stat so like oh it's it's hard isn't it um I think there's something to be said about just like being a little bit gentle with yourself and recognizing that we do 
ebb and throw ebb and flow through these kind of meaningful moments and the 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 kind of minutes and and humdrum things that we have to get on with um and we have to kind of experience them both so there's a bit of acceptance to that um that said I do think there are things that you can do to kind of ritualize and resource and kind of anchor in these experiences when I did that exercise at the beginning to take you to a past experience where you felt really strong and really amazing and I said well you can bring that forward when you're feeling you know rough make sure that when you feel amazing you actually lock that in as a resource in that moment and you bring that with you and you're like man I just completed that rally and I feel this and these are my people and you know you lock that into your body and your heart and your soul and you feel it and and you share it with people and share it in a way that feels meaningful and, you know, share photos and come back to them. Like, how, how can you create something that feels like a little ritual and a nod to what you've accomplished that to what you've accomplished that you can kind of take with you? Um, that's one thing. Another thing is probably something I would urge event organizers to think about, which is it's a journey, right? Like there's a before, which what we're, which is what we're paying attention to now, which is like, God, how do we get people to the start line? What's, what are some of the fears and the blockers and things like that? How do we start people on the journey now? Um, and then after, like, let's carry on the journey. How do we, how do we continue momentum in a community? How do we keep people connected? You know, that's, that's also on some of the organizers who want to make some changes. So and just some high level thoughts. I'm sure others have some thoughts too. I can offer up uh, something that I learned at the beginning of the year. Um, I'm a big, uh, big podcast person. I, I love watching and listening to podcasts. Uh, Rich Roll is one of the ones that I enjoy quite a lot, which I, I think probably some of you will know. And he did one at the beginning of the year, one of his coaches corner. Um, and it's with ex-professional athletes, ex-gold medalists. Um, and they talk about this subject. Um, and it was really interesting how all of them talked about how shifting your perspective from the event being the goal, performing at the event being the goal, to actually a different goal where you're looking at your growth and, your, and the journey and the trajectory you're on. And that event is actually just a milestone. So you don't have as much of the come down because that's not the end of the road. That's just a significance that you're progressing towards this bigger goal that you're looking to. And so that might be, you know, if you want to build more adventure into your life or how you're doing it or to it could be a fitness goal or it could be an exploration of yourself or whatever it happens to be. That This is a mechanism that's just helping you shift along there. So as you come through it, you can do like what Caitlin's saying, you're celebrating that you've reached that milestone and it's, and it's now your next stepping stone as you move on. So you're actually building a layer rather than reaching the end of a cliff, if that kind of works. It's a, it was a really interesting discussion between them. I found it quite enlightening. Mm, that's really relatable. And I'm sure that you guys will have had similar things, but some of my favorite rides have actually been the training rides leading up to a big event. Like some of the most memorable, incredible, quite often the most grueling. <laughs> um probably spent in the hills of wales you know it's not just about the actual event when you're there but it's the whole thing isn't it um cool so we've got about five minutes um left so i think we've got time for a couple more um questions um somebody's asking um that they're really concerned about speed. They say that's a huge hurdle for them. Um, they say, I'm constantly afraid I'm not fast enough. What's the typical average speed that people maintain on rides like this? Maybe Lael, this is a good one for you. Yeah, definitely. I think the main thing is not really speed, but time on the bike. So you look at a, an event like this, and this is even what I do for you know my racing, I think, okay, how far is it? How many days do I want to finish it in? How many kilometers do I need to ride per day? How many days of, or how many hours of daylight do I have? In something like early May, you know, we probably have what, 10 hours a day of daylight at that point. So 85 kilometers, 10 hours of daylight, 8.5 kilometers per hour. And that includes all your breaks. And it's like, at some point, you know, you're, 
you know, you, you have climbs and you have descent. So if you feel like, you know, you could usually, I look at it, most touring pace, you end up going like 15 K an hour, including all the breaks you take. It's like, well, if you can do that for X amount of hours, then you can get it done. And then you don't have to be fast. You just have to be consistent. Um, so, you know, and then looking at these routes, it's like, okay, what are the challenges for the day? Okay. I have this climb. I need to get to this place to get food and I need to find somewhere to sleep. And then just taking it on day to day to cover those needs. Um, I really believe that if you spend time on the bike leading up to this, that this is attainable for almost everybody. Um, and that's the exciting part about it is that you don't have to be a superhero athlete to do it. Uh, you can be, you, you can be a hero yourself just, just for being out there. And then if you are, and you share that experience, maybe somebody else who doubted themselves will be like, well, she did it. Maybe I can do it. And I feel like a lot of people have said that to me, they, they send me personal messages where they're like, you did this. And it got me outside for two hours, you know, because I don't know, we all have to just try our hardest, but I think this is actually attainable. It's just uh, challenging. And I think um, with the rallies as well, when you actually really look at the mileage, it's like very achievable, isn't it? Um, with the time frame. Um, and as Lael said earlier on the women's TNR, we were actually like wanting to stay out there. <laughs> And we stopped, we had lunch together. We like really took our time and enjoyed it. We didn't necessarily finish in the dark. We were finishing at sunset, setting up camp um, and really enjoying those like super special moments together. Um, uh, so we have a question about sleeping outside. Um, while I can get my head around the idea of riding, I'm not sure. Um, like stay in hotels or accommodation last year and yeah the answer is yes um you can the thing with the rally is um we all embark on our own adventure and we can choose how we adventure um we can camp bivy you can stay in refuges, which I highly recommend. Um, staying in a refuge is an amazing experience in itself. Um, you can book Airbnbs, you can find hotels, you can really um, like shape and mold your adventure um, to suit your needs. And, and you, you won't be alone <laughs> staying in accommodation. Yeah. And you don't have to go completely one way or the other. Even for most of us that were more on the camping side, we do like one night camping, one night in a refuge or a chalet or something or a couple nights of each and then it's so nice when you get a shower and a hot meal <laughs> that isn't something cooked out of your jet boil um cool and we have a question about being nervous about mechanical issues um and the thought of being solo and having to fix and repair these um, the person who's anonymous who's written the question has um, said that, that I guess I need to sign up to a basic workshop course. Um, any suggestions? I mean, I think really you don't have to be an expert mechanic to do this. Uh, the biggest thing would be to arrive with a bike that's in good working order. Um, even I, during the Trinonius rally, I couldn't get into my easiest gear for the first day and it was terrible. It was the steepest <laughs> climb of the whole thing. And I was just grinding it out. And, and I, uh, I had to teach myself how to adjust my derailleur with YouTube videos and it took me hours and I did it. And then that was a huge breakthrough. I was like, I could do it, you know, and I've always been a terrible mechanic, but really the main thing is having your equipment in good shape when you start. Um, and then beyond that, it's, it doesn't have to work perfectly to work. Um, you really need to keep air in your tires, you know, so that's, that's a big one. Be able to fix a flat. I think Nick out there probably fixed six flats, you know, it's that kind of thing, but you, and people changed out brake pads, but beyond that, it's like, you know, it might be making some noise, but you're getting through it. Um, and I don't think that should be an ultimate limiter. That said, if you, if it gives you more confidence to work on mechanics and learn these things, then you have time to do that before we get out there. 
Um, but really, there was such a wide range of abilities uh, for that. And that's just another one of those um, areas where some were stronger than others. But also, you have a community out there where we were kind of troubleshooting together. And um, that's also gives you some kind of confidence, too. And we've actually got one final question, which works, works out perfectly um, because we're almost out of time. Um, a question on climbing. Um, climbing is an issue for me. I live in a flat area and have never done more than 1500 meters vertical per day. Is this reasonable for a gravel rally? More generally, how do you evaluate your physical ability uh, to stretch to meet a goal uh, when wanting to sign up? Yeah, that's a tough one. We did have one woman, Nick, that uh, is one of the organizers for the New Forest Off-Road Club Comfort Torino Nice Rally. And she told me after the first day that it was the first time she'd ever climbed a mountain pass. And I couldn't believe it because we had 10 of them. The first one was the hardest and she, she it was definitely hard, but she did it, you know, and this is totally possible. It's definitely better if you have, you know, a chance to get some climbing in, but time on your bike is the most important thing for sure. Um, and sometimes not all of us have access to these places. And that's why we want to do these events to see more of the world. So it's, you know, don't miss out on it. Take more time while you're there. Cool. Thank you all so much for speaking this evening. And thank you so much to everyone who joined. I really hope that everyone um, is feeling super motivated to embark on their next adventure or sign up for a um, women's rally. Um, the next women's rally is going to take place on the 29th of April on the Montanas Vercas um, route, which is in Spain. Um, I put the link into the chat earlier, but I'll also share it in the follow up email. Um, you can check out all the route information in Lael's collection. Um, along with lots of highlights along the way of places to stay um, and some really stunning pictures of things that we can hope to see on the route. Um, the registration goes live on January 31st um, at eight o'clock in the morning, Central European time. Um, so if you're keen to sign up, set your alarm. Um, there'll be 50 spaces um, for women to come and ride and it's free to enter. All you need to do is turn up. Thanks for putting this together, Gabby. This is amazing. And I loved hearing from Caitlin and Wendy and thanks for being a wonderful host, Catherine. I'm super fired up and I hope everybody that's here joins us. And if you can't, then uh, you can go on your own adventures mm -hmm. and invite your friends. Thank you cool. so much, everyone. Thank you, much. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.